Let's, uh, let's open our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 1. Again, Hebrews, chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, and we concluded with verse 8 last week. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. That's God the Father speaking to God the Son. That's a great verse to support the Trinity of the Godhead uh, and the deity of Jesus Christ. So naturally it causes problems for many cults, none of whom believe in the Trinity or the perfect deity of Jesus Christ. But let's continue, verse nine. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. That is, thou, God the Son, hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. You can't be a good lover unless you're also a good hater of, some, of other things. You can't love cleanliness unless you hate dirt. That's the, that's the motivation for you to keep cleaning things. And he says, God the Father hath anointed thee, God the Son, with the oil of gladness. That's the type of the Holy Spirit, above thy fellows. The oil of gladness is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, and it's typified in the Old Testament by the anointing of Aaron and his sons to the priesthood. Run back, if you will, to Psalm 133, please. Psalm 133. Psalm 133, and start there, if you will, the first verse. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. Uh, the phrase in our text, above thy fellows, that indicates that neither Melchizedek, Genesis 14, or Aaron uh, had the Holy Spirit in the same way or in the same manner in which the Lord Jesus did. And the anointing on the head of Aaron, as Psalm 133 mentions, shows that our head is the Lord Jesus Christ. Run, run uh, back, if you will, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians Colossians 1, and one verse there, verse 18, speaking of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He's in heaven and we are his body here on the earth, the head should always control the body. And it doesn't work very well when it's, when it's done the other way around. Sometimes your flesh wants to commit such something or get away with something, and you're, you're hoping that you can rationalize it uh, in your mind, your conscience, that your conscience will acquiesce, accept it as being okay. But things don't usually work well when it's done that way. The head of the, of the body of Christ is Christ himself. And that, that, that's another good argument to debunk the whole claim that somehow Simon Peter, and then under him the College of Cardinals, uh, is the, are, are the decision makers. They're the authority of Christ's church. Christ's church is not some earthly global corporation that is represented at the United Nations uh, and uh, to which every member should pay dues each week. We can call them tithes and offerings, but the, the, the truth is it, they are dues 
to a global corporation that you became a member of, like you would join the you know, Rotary Club or join some particular fraternity or become a member of some big uh, industrial uh, organization. But he's our head, we are his body here on the earth, and the will of the head, the will of Christ himself, ought to be the thing that directs and controls the actions and the response and the behavior and the worship of the church here on the earth, not the other way around. And I mentioned in our church, we sometimes try to do what we want to do in hopes that God will accept it afterwards. I'm going to go to that party, God, but I'll be saved. I can still be saved, right? Yes, you can, but you're a lousy Christian. You're a rotten testimony for Jesus Christ. I know there's going to be a lot of drinking there and probably people fooling around with each other, but I, I'm not going to let myself get involved. Why are you even there? But, um, but my friends, my, my boss, he invited me to that party and so forth. I'm invited to a party at my boss's house in two weeks. He's got a nice home, nice swimming pool, barbecue and so forth. He's going to cater the food. I don't want to go because it means I'm going to have to hang around with the same people I've already spent eight hours with at work that day. And then, of course, everyone's invited to bring a family member with them. Why would I want to subject my wife to that? I, we had a party last year. My, my daughter went with me. But uh, frankly, I was afraid to take her there because I know the way some of these yahoos are. And I just, I mean, she's mature enough. She handled herself. She's, she knows how people can be, and so it worked out all right. But why would, you know, I, I go to work every day, and uh, someone will say, good morning, Mike, how are you? And I've, I've started adopting the phrase, well, here I am, back for more. Until now, other people are uh, are uh, uh, ex adopting that same phrase. Here we are, back from Mark. And I mean it humorously, but sometimes you feel that that's your seriously your serious um, reaction. And I didn't get enough sleep last. I wish I was home, still in bed. That's how I really feel. But here I am, back for more. And it's not that bad, but you, you have to exaggerate it a bit. But when you put up with unsaved people, do you know at my job, uh, all of those who smoke and curse and are all tattooed up are the women at my place of employment. None of the men use profanity like the women can. None of the men are smokers. And to my knowledge, none of them have tattoos. But the women sure do. Everything's changed. How did women become swearing sailors and truck drivers uh, without ever having joined the Navy or driven a truck? <laughs> they become that way. Whereas the men are much more uh, agreeable and easy to converse with and get along with. But times have changed. The world has gone crazy. Um, it's chaotic. So why would I want to go there on my free time and hang around those people and I'm not getting paid to, to do that, right? <laughs> I go there because they pay me to go there. And I need the money and I need the benefits that I can get from it. But why would I want to subject myself to it for a few more hours after work? Now, who knows? I don't know if I'm going to go or not. But, but anyway, sometimes the flesh wants to do something and then hopefully rationalize us about the conscience, the mind, will accept it and say, yeah, it's okay, let it go this time. But look at verses 10, 11, and 12. And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They, that is the heavens, shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. Notice uh, verses 13 and 14. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? 
Now, verses 13 and 14, these two verses hold the context of all these other verses together. We're still considering the superiority of Christ over the angels. However, we suddenly have three verses, uh, 10, 11, and 12, inserted, which deal with the power and the eternity of God, of the Creator. And this is done for two good reasons. First of all, to show that the one who called Jesus Christ his Son, up in verse 5, and the one who called him, who actually called him God, in verse 8, is eternal. Therefore, his pronouncements about Christ are going to be absolutely fixed and inviolable. They cannot be changed. And secondly, we've just been told that his throne, verse 8, is forever and ever. So it will endure as long as God endures. Now let's examine that. It says, And thou, Lord, verse 10, in the beginning, that's going to be a reference back to Genesis 1, verse 1, hast laid the foundation of of the earth. Run back, if you will, to Job chapter 38. Or for the homeless people who might be watching Job. <laughs> Go back to the book of Job chapter 38. That's not politically correct, Pastor, to say that. Who cares? <laughs> you get too much of that sort of politically correct sensitivity slop. I got to thinking about this earlier this week, all these so-called justice, social justice warriors marching for this, marching for that, complaining about, you know, their breakfast, it wasn't cooked the way they wanted. I mean, they complain about everything. And I said this recently, I wouldn't trust those people to vote. If you're 18, 19, 20, 21, you're still in college, you're that temperamental, your feelings are that fragile, you certainly don't need to be voting in an election because that's for grown-ups. <laughs> That's for people who weigh the issues and weigh the consequences of an election going this way or that way, weigh the qualifications of a candidate, per se, uh, for example, and then make an informed, educated decision. You're not able to do that yet. So go back inside and don't come out until you're about 26, 27. So I wouldn't trust those people to vote. I don't trust them to drive a car on the street. And I told you why. I'll come up to a traffic light. It's a red light. They'll be might be triggered, you know. Someone's trying to tell me what I can't do. I wouldn't trust you to walk across the street. I wouldn't trust you to tell me what time it is. You might be lying to me. Because your whole your whole construct of your world is built upon falsehoods anyway. But I got to think about this. Uh, when a kid's four or five, three, four or five years old, and they're trying to get their way by throwing a temper tantrum and crying, what's the best way to fix that? <laughs> Two or three good swats to the backside, firm good swats, and say, knock it off. Yeah. That'll fix the problem right there. It didn't take more than about twice, and the kid learns, right? So I've got to believe all of these people marching in the streets who grew up with Dr. Benjamin Spock's garbage about raising children, don't spank children. Maybe most adults didn't read that book, but the news media sure read it and picked up on it and been promoting it in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, about uh, time out and, you know, reaffirm the child's goodness and reward them for the good things they do. And don't criticize this. Life is too short to wait for the kid to, to cooperate with you. Spank them first and then give them their time out. Yeah. That's how it works. <clears throat> but, uh, so I gotta believe we got a whole generation, maybe two generations, the parents and the, and the kids now, who were never swatted as a kid. So they're acting out like a temper tantrum, not getting their way. Hillary didn't win. Hillary didn't win. Thank the Lord she didn't win. <laughs> Praise God. Glory, hallelujah, she didn't win. Do I think Donald Trump's the answer? Absolutely not. No good Christian with any sense would, have, would ever say that. But I'll tell you what, he's a thousand times better than a lying Hillary, <laughs> crooked Hillary. What I don't understand is, you know, I got to thinking about this. This is before the 2000 election. I'll get back to this in just a second. But if Hillary had won the election in 2016, it would mean, <clears throat> Obama notwithstanding, it would mean that the presidency for the last...
24 years had been controlled by two families, the Bushes and the Clintons. Or for the most part, most of, the, most of that time, 24, 28, it would mean the presidency of the United States was controlled by two well-connected families. That shouldn't be in a country of 300 million citizens. And one guy who had succeeded in business and had multiple billions of dollars, he wasn't indebted to anybody. He could finance his own campaign, largely. But he still received donations. People who said, you're saying what I've been wanting our politicians to say. I'm willing to help you get elected. They knew going into it, he was a loudmouth and a wild card, and would, was likely to say whatever he felt like. But they're willing to overlook that because he's, he's someone I think is going to actually follow through on what he promises to do. I was so tired of hearing Republicans, my party, uh, promise we're going to fix our broken immigration system. We're going to fix all these government giveaway programs. You haven't done a squat. Now things are starting to change. Now things are starting to improve. And I'm, I'm grateful to God for it. As an American, as an American citizen, I'm happy to see it. But my American citizenship and, and the things that I think are show some positive change in the country have nothing to do with my spiritual approach to God, my spiritual understanding of the Word of God. So we should never try to uh, conflate these things or confuse these things and say that they're equal with each other. But God gives us a little bit more breathing space as a country, and we should avail ourselves of whatever opportunities come to us as Christians, as long as we can. I wish the rapture would happen today. My brother asked me this morning, is today the day? And I knew what he meant by that, and I said, I sure hope so. I'm still praying, so. Look at Job 38, and verses 4, 5, and 6. God asked Job, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare, if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest, or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof? And uh, God, speaking to Job, says, uh, Tell me, what do you know about the creation? What do you know about how it was put together? Who did it? And how was it constructed? What, what causes it to operate? What causes it to function? What causes all of the planets to move in their respective orbits the way they do, consistently, day after day, and year after year? Uh, and he says, Declare, if thou knowest. Of course, Job had no idea. How do you respond to questions like that? Um, but here in our text, um, it says in verse 10, And the heavens, plural, are the works of thine hands. And there the, the writer of Hebrews is quoting Psalm 102 and verse 25, which we, we won't turn to. And the reference is to the original earth and the first, second, and third heavens, which followed. You can read about those in Genesis chapter 1, about verses 2 down to verse 8, 7, 8, long in there. And the verse implies the theory of creationism, which the public school system wants to suppress at any cost. Back in 1925, there happened in Dayton, Tennessee, what's known as the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. There's a public school teacher named John Scopes, and uh, beside the theory of the Bible's explanation of creation, which was being taught in public schools at that time, imagine that. Bible being taught at taxpayer expense. But he wanted to teach Charles Darwin's theories of evolution. And uh, this went to trial. He sued the school district and so forth. And the school district got uh, a well-known attorney by uh, the name of um, mm, William, William Jennings Bryan. And I forget the attorney for the for the State. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But, um, but the state lost that court case, and from that point on, the state was forced to teach creation, or the Bible's account, along with the theories of Darwin's evolution. And the ACLU, which was a young organization, only started in 1920, came to the defense of Mr. Scopes, and they argued in that case for his point of view, 
and they won that case, and they insisted that it was wrong to teach just one theory of origins, that you're, right. you're closing off uh, students from com getting more complete information, and let them make up their own minds afterwards. Well, after they won that case, then they began a great campaign, which continues to this day, and they reversed course and said, now it's wrong to teach two theories, that we should only teach one. And of course, which one do you think they prefer? The one that they want to couch in technical jargon and make you think it's all scientific, when there's not a shred, not an iota of evidence that anything evolves into something, something better all by itself without any intelligent direction behind it at all. It never happens. He said, well, if we create the, the circum conditions in a laboratory, certain chemicals we put together and give it a spark of electricity in some amoeba forms, all that proves is it took intelligence to create the circumstances for it to happen. You're arguing for our side. You're arguing that it takes an intelligent God to make these things happen. You're not arguing for uh, evolution and and automatic progress without any purpose behind it. You're actually arguing for our side. And, um, but uh, now they say it's wrong to teach more than one theory. And um, <clears throat> the scriptures declare creationism as a presumed and an absolute fact. The Bible never questions that God made it. It never stops to debate and ask, well, did he or didn't he or how did he do this? And, Maybe it happened by itself. It never questions that. Even people who were not part of Israel, uh, the, the heathen, as it were, they understood that. Uh, let me run into two verses. They're both in the book of Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah um, chapter 38. <laughs> Jeremiah 38. <clears throat> uh, verse 16. It says, So Zedekiah the king swears secretly unto Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord liveth that made us this soul, I will not put thee to death, neither will I give thee into the hand of these men that seek thy life. And look back there at Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah 14 and verse 22. It says, Are there any among the vanities of the Gentiles that can cause rain? Or can the heavens give showers? Art not thou he, O Lord our God? Therefore we will wait upon thee, for thou hast made all these things. The functions of nature, the, 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 the uh, phenomenon of rain, storms, and we would have to say thunder, lightning, electrical storms, and all the rest, are part of the creation of God. It's taken as an absolute fact. It's assumed, it's presumed to be true from the very start of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And I'll run through a few charts. I've used these before. And this is what's not supposed to be taught. In fact, this isn't even taught in most Christian schools. I'm just about to get it. In the beginning, God created the heaven singular, and the earth, singular. Genesis 1.1. I like what Kent Hovind says, the answers to reality can be found in the very first verse of the Bible. He says, what we call reality, time, space, matter, and energy, are all contained within the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, there's the time element, God created, there's the energy, the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. All four of those elements which define reality are answered in the very first verse of the Bible. Very succinct, right to the point, very concise, very clear, not, no extra uh, word, wording uh, that's superfluous, none of that. It's right to the point. And, uh, but man don't want, men, men don't want to believe it. Mankind doesn't want to accept it. And you can't improve on it. And Ken Hoven, one of his videos, it's sort of gone viral. He's answering, he baited three secular um, evolutionists and professors at uh, Embry-Riddle uh, Aeronautic School. 
and he says, the, your concept of God, the one of them asked, where did God come from? And I'm going to be paraphrasing the video, but he, he says, well, your, your assumption of God, you're believing the wrong kind of God. See, the God I believe in is outside of time and space. He lives in another dimension. Uh, these things we see around us, the universe and all of its, the movement of all the planets, mm -hmm. those things are there for our benefit. Those are the things by which we count uh, hours and days and weeks and months and years and centuries, and we gauge uh, time by the way the planets orbit uh, around us, and we around the, uh, 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 in relation to the sun and the moon and so forth. Those things are there for our benefit, but the God who made them is by definition outside of time and space. He says, all of those things had to come into existence at the same time. He says, you couldn't have um, matter without space. If you had matter, where would you put it? If you had matter and space but no time, when would you put it? He says, this is what's called a continuum. Um, the, you know, the time-space continuum that Star Trek likes to invoke so many times in their mythology. But, so time, space, matter, all came into existence at the same moment, and the in but where did the energy come from? You say the Big Bang, and they define the Big Bang as nothing, complete nothing, suddenly exploding into everything. Well, what exploded? Something had to be there to explode. So where did that something or that matter come from? And uh, where did the energy come from? What caused it to explode? He says, essentially, the Big Bang theory that it all exploded into the reality we see all at one moment, they call that the great, um, the singularity. That's the term they call it, the singularity, rather than saying the beginning or so forth. Uh, it all happened at one moment. You're basically defining, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth for us. <laughs> but, but, but rather than accepting the Bible's probable time frame for it, they keep wanting to put it back 20 billion years ago, it happened. And given enough time, these things sort of work themselves out and fall into these certain patterns of orbit around each other as we see it today. And of course, that's a lot of hooey. But beside, I said this is something that most Christian schools aren't going to teach. Most Christian churches aren't going to preach this. And after that, you run to the New Testament, 2 Peter 3, 5. By the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Say, where did the water come from? I don't know, but neither do any atheist, does any atheist or anyone else. But there's water in outer space. They, they, all, all the ice that surrounds the planets, that's made of water, isn't it? At one time, the, earth, the universe was filled with water, and then uh, it drowned out the world. By which, it says here, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Excuse my bad artwork. 2 Peter 3, verse 6. So at some point, the earth was standing out of the water and in the water, as I just showed you, and then God drowned the world by water, and the world that then was perished. Run back to Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. That was the next stage in the progression. And then you read, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, let it divide the waters from the waters, and God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. God called the firmament heaven. And this here would be what we call outer space. The visible universe that we see in the night sky. Now, we don't see it very well in the city with a lot of city lights obstructing it, but obscuring it. But uh, if you, and I've said this be to you before, maybe you're tired of me referring to it. 
Yeah, but you can look on the look. Yeah, you very seldom do you hear anyone recommending the internet, but there are some interesting things to be found on, particularly YouTube and things recorded by ordinary mm -hmm. citizens. And the 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 little star at the end of the Big Dipper's handle is called Alpha Alpha Draconis or Alpha Centauri. That's the North Star. And um, it apparently doesn't move anywhere. We never see it moving and so forth. But you go out in the night sky, focus your video camera on it, and if you have a camera that takes can take time lapse pictures of it uh, from sundown once it gets dark, and your camera is fixed on that north star, and every 20 seconds or so it snaps another picture during nighttime. Six, seven hours later, after the sun is after the sun rises again, you'll see that video. You'll see all the stars in the night sky orbiting in a perfect circle around that fixed point. If you go and you find videos on YouTube taken in Australia of the of the sky in the southern hemisphere, they are orbiting in the opposite direction. And uh, there are some videos of people who are filming the night sky in Brazil along the equator, and everything's just simply moving upward. Everything's moving upward. Now, the astronomers will say that's because the Earth rotating uh, would naturally show the stars moving in different directions from different angles. However, claiming that the Earth rotates at a thousand miles an hour, and the circumference of the Earth is supposed to be 24,000 miles, therefore it takes 24 hours, for the Earth to make one complete revolution. They also say that the Earth is hurtling through space at 66,000 miles an hour. Not only are we rotating at 1,000 miles an hour, we're also hurtling through space at 66,000 miles. Now, those two things combined together would prevent anybody from ever being able to focus their camera on one fixed point and have it stay there all night long. Right? So that's why I lean I'm leaning towards the geocentric model that the Earth is the center of everything. According to the scriptures, it would suggest that the Earth was the first thing that God made before he made any of the stars, the sun, the moon, anything we see in the sky. And this is where Christ's uh, throne will one day be situated. And if you wanted to find some geographic, they say the geographic center of all the land mass in the world is focused right there where the, the, the pyramids at Giza are, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. But I think someone must have made a mistake. I think the center, the geographic center of all the land mass in the world is probably at Calvary, or at Jerusalem. Because that's where Christ is from which he's from where he's going to rule over the world and the universe by extension. And so it's my growing conviction that the earth doesn't rotate anywhere. Everything else goes around us. And I'm still researching, still looking, looking up some information about it, still consulting those who know more about that. And maybe very soon we can do a study on it. But it's my growing conviction that the earth doesn't go anywhere. Everything goes around us. And uh, I'm gonna leave it right there. And you're gonna say, oh gosh, is that, don't, why, why tease us, Pastor? Because it's fun to do it that way. <laughs>